This is part D for unit 5 on multiple regression. And we've been going through these three questions that we can address with multiple regression that we could represent with these three frogs. The first question was the question of this kind of green tree frog up here, which is what, are the, what is the effect of each x variable on an outcome, ignoring all the others? And then we looked at the question of what is the effect of all the x variables taken together on an outcome. And then we looked at the effect of each x variable controlling for the others. And for each of these qu three questions, we've been looking at what is the effect size, what statistic will give us an effect size that will answer that question. And then we've been looking at what inferential statistic will test the significance of that effect size. So for our first question, what is the effect of each variable ignoring the others? Uh, the effect size was the regular bivariate correlation, lowercase r, or we could square it and do r squared, but that's less common. The default would be to report the unsquared, lowercase r, the, the bivariate correlation, and we would test the, the significance of that correlation with a t-test. And then for the question of what is the effect of all the variables taken together, in this case, we'll use the squared statistic, the capital R squared, the squared multiple correlation will be our effect size. And then we test the significance of that with an F statistic. And then we were looking at the question of what is the effect of each X variable controlling for all the others? And we uh, looked at several different ways we could address that. We could look at a just an unstandardized beta weight. That would be one type of effect size or we could do a standardized beta, and that will be the default, the one that I want you to use if I don't specify anything. Uh, that in general is a very good way to address that effect size. Or we could do a partial correlation, which is very, very similar to a standardized beta. It depends on whether or not we're standardizing variables first and then extracting uniquenesses. We get a standardized beta. Or if we're first extracting uniquenesses, and then, standardize, then standardizing those uniquenesses, we get a partial correlation. And regardless of whether we use a beta, standardized beta, or partial correlation, we test the significance of those with a t-test. And as you can see on the slide, I'm saying, but wait, there's more. So we could use, in terms of this question here about what is the effect of each variable controlling for the others, we could use a beta, we could use a standardized beta, we could use a partial correlation, but wait, there's more. We could also use this thing called a semi-partial correlation, and the semi-partial correlation can also be called a delta R squared or R squared change, or different names for the same thing. So let's take a look at what that thing is. So the best way to explain what a semi-partial correlation is, is to compare it with a partial correlation and to look at Venn diagrams and compare these two types of statistics. And that's, that's what I have here on the slide. On the left hand side, I have this new thing I'm talking about. This actually, I got a, a new frog picture to go with the semi-partial correlation on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I have our partial correlation. So recall, we already talked about this partial correlation, that that is looking at if we, for example, what is the effect of x1 predicting y after controlling for x2? So x2 gets extracted out of everything, and we have this part here, the uniqueness or the residual of x1 with x2 extracted out. That's the unique part of x1 that can't be explained by x2. And we have the uniqueness of y, that part of y that can't be explained by x2. And for the partial correlation, we're looking at what percent of the uniqueness of y can be explained by the uniqueness of x1. And we can represent that in this formula down here, area B. That's the overlap, this blue area here, area B. That's the overlap between the uniqueness of x1 and the uniqueness of y. So again, the partial correlation is addressing the question of what part of the uniqueness of y can be explained by the uniqueness of x1. And those uniquenesses are the part that's left over after x2 is extracted out of everything. So let's contrast that with a semi-partial correlation. What we're going to do here is we're going to extract our control variable x2, or whatever our control variable is, we're going to extract 
the control variable out of x, in this case we want to get the effect for x1, we'll extract the control variable out of x1, but we're not going to extract the control variable out of y. So what we'll get here is we'll get something, we'll answer the question, what part of the total variance of y is explained by the uniqueness of x? So again, to contrast here with the partial correlation on the right-hand side, we're answering the question, what part of the uniqueness of y is explained by the uniqueness of x? And on the, and on the left-hand side, we're answering the question, what part of the total variance of y is explained by the uniqueness of x? And so we can represent the, the semi-partial correlation with the formula area b. Note both of these cases, both uh, the semi-partial correlation, the partial correlation, as well as a beta weight and a standardized beta weight, these are all statistics that are telling us about the size of area B. So they're all looking at how big is area B, that part of uh, how much does X1 explain variance in Y after controlling for the other variables. So they're all addressing that question. The difference between the partial correlation and the semi-partial correlation is we're going to compare the size of area B to what? With the partial correlation, we're comparing the size of area B to just the uniqueness of y, that part that couldn't be explained by my control variable. Whereas with the semi-partial correlation, we're going to compare the size of area B to the total variance of y, not just the uniqueness of y, but to that total variance of y. And so with the semi-partial correlation, or to be clear, I have the unsquared, I'm not taking the square root of it yet. So if I, t if I don't take the square root, I have my squared semi-partial correlation. And just to be clear, on the right-hand side, this was actually the squared partial correlation. So if I took the square root, then I would have the unsquared, but I'm, I'm looking at the squared versions on this slide. And so the squared semi-partial correlation is area B divided by the total variance of Y, which is area A plus B plus C plus D. That's the total variance of Y. So again, the difference is the squared partial correlation is area B divided by just the uniqueness of y, the part that couldn't be explained by the control variable, area a plus b, whereas with the squared semi-partial correlation, it's area b divided by the total variance of y. So they're both looking at the size of area b. It's just a matter of, do you want to compare the size of area b to just the uniqueness of y, or do you want to compare the size of area b to the total variance of y? And here I have just a single slide for the semi-partial correlation all by itself. Most of this is the same thing we saw on the previous slide, showing that again the squared semi-partial correlation is area B divided by the total variance of Y. And I just added the clarification at the bottom here that if we take the square root of that, we will have the unsquared semi-partial correlation, uh, just like we've done with our other statistics where we have a squared and unsquared version. So the semi-partial correlation not squared is the square root of area B divided by the total variance of Y. One thing that happens when we use semi-partial correlations is that we can talk about the variance of Y being divided into pieces or parts, just like maybe we might take a pizza and divide it into pieces. And if we take all those pizza, all the pieces of our pizza and add them together, they add up to the whole pizza. And so here we have the total variance of y, and we can think of dividing it into parts or pieces. So we could say one part of y might be explained by our initial control variable. It says how much variance is explained by just the control variable by itself, and that might be one piece. And then we can say, well, what additional section do we have here that's explained when we add x1 to our equation? So this allows us to think about uh, regression equations in kind of a sequential format. We could say, if I had a simple regression where I had just say x2 by itself, how much variance, just ignoring x1, so that, that's the question, what's the effect of x2, ignoring x1, how much variance in y would be explained by x2, and area dc would be the variance explained by s by x2, and then how much additional variance gets explained when I add x1 to my equation. So I'm saying out of the total variance of y, how much of that pizza pie was explained by x2 by itself? How big was that piece? How big was the piece for just x2 by itself? 
And then when I added x1 to my equation, how big was that piece? How much additional variance was explained when I added x1 to my equation? So I'm getting percent of variance explained. It's all going to add up to the total variance of y, the amount that was explained by x2 by itself, plus the amount, the additional amount explained by x1 would equal the total amount that we explained all together uh, in y. And that allows us to use this language of what's the additional variance explained when I add this variable to an equation. So the value of using this type of language, the language of a semi-partial correlation, and talking about the additional variance explained in y, the value of that type of language actually isn't all that great if I'm just talking about the effect of a single x variable on y controlling for the other variables in the equation. Where this really gets useful, however, is that if I talk about sets of variables more than one, so I could have groups or sets of variables. For example, maybe I have a regression equation that I start off with three x variables. Maybe I have x1, x2, and x3. Maybe I have these three predictors uh, that I use to predict y. And then maybe I add two more. Maybe I have x4 and x5. And so now I can say I start off with one set of predictors, and I can say how much variance was explained with this first set of predictors. And then I can say how much additional variance was explained when I added these additional two predictors to my model. And what I'm doing here is I'm switching from a focused question where I'm looking at just two variables, one x variable and one y. So a focused question is one we can address with two hands. So if I want to know what's the effect of this one x variable on this one outcome, controlling for the other variables in the equation, that's a focused question. But now I'm moving to an omnibus question where I say, after controlling for these three predictors, x1, x2, and x3, how much additional variance was explained when I add another set of, say, two predictors to my equation. So that's moving from a focused question now to an omnibus question. And the key advantage we get when we move to a semi-partial correlation is that it allows us to talk about, use this language of what is the additional variance explained when something is added to our equation. And that's valuable because we can talk about the additional variance explained not only when we add just a single x variable to our equation, but also, what's the additional variance explained when I add an entire set of predictors to an equation? And that's where this becomes especially useful. And that makes sense in terms of some of the other names for our uh, semi-partial correlation. So a semi-partial correlation um, can also be called the R-square change, which is going to be the R-square is the percent of variance explained. And we're looking at the change in the percent of variance explained when we add a variable or a set of variables or a set of predictors to an equation. So actually, the sum and partial correlation would be unsquared. We could square that, and the squared sum and partial correlation would be the same thing exactly as R squared change. So squared sum and partial correlation, R squared change, two identical terms for the, or two, two different terms for the identical statistic. They're the, uh, uh, they, they mean the exact same thing, semi-partial correlation and R-squared change. Because, and we can think of it, the semi-partial correlation, which we're saying is that our control variable is not partialed out of both X and Y. Our control variable is only partialed out of X, but not out of Y. That's where that name comes from. Or we could call it the R-squared change, because we're looking at the change in the percent of variance explained when we add a variable or set of variables to an equation. So that's why the semi-partial correlation squared is the same thing as R squared change. And then a couple other ways we can notate the exact same thing. We could use this delta, this triangle Greek uh, letter delta, which is often used as a shorthand for the word change. So rather than writing out the word change, we could use the Greek letter delta and just call it delta R squared. And because delta is a symbol that often means change, Delta R squared is the same thing as R squared change. Or we could write it out delta R squared. So these are all different terms that refer to the same statistic. So how would we calculate the R squared change or the semi-partial correlation?
Uh, it's easiest to talk about the squared version, how we would calculate the squared version. So let's focus on that. So we'll look at how would we calculate the semi-partial correlation squared, squared semi-partial correlation, which is the same thing as R squared change. And let's go back to the situation where I have uh, just two x variables, x1 and x2, and I want to get the semi squared semi-partial correlation for x1. As I was mentioning before, usually we would use this type of procedure if I'm wanting to get the amount of variance explained by a set of variables, multiple predictors taken together in a set. Uh, but let's, let's simplify things back to, down to a situation where I have just two variables. Say I have uh, x1 and x2, and, uh, and I'm going to call x1. It's going to be my target variable. It's the variable that I want to get my squared semi-partial correlation for. I want to know what is the additional variance explained by x1 after controlling for x2. So in this case, I'm going to say x1, that's going to be my target variable. That's the one that I want to get my sem squared semi-partial correlation for. And it, this will work the same even if I had, for example, if I had, uh, uh, say I had x, maybe I had a couple control variables and a whole set of target variables. So I could say I, maybe I had three different control variables. Maybe I was trying to explain how uh, how happy people were in marriages. Maybe I had a bunch of people who were all married, and I wanted to explain how happy they were uh, in their marriage relationships. And maybe I had some control variables, like I X, maybe I had one X variable was uh, the length of their relationship, and another X variable was maybe um, uh, the age at which they were married, and maybe I had a third X variable, which is maybe how many children they have in their relationship. And so maybe those are my control variables, but my target variables what I really wanted to understand was what is the effect, maybe I had one variable that had to do with communication behavior, that uh, was how well they communicated when they had conflict. And maybe I had another X variable that had to do with the attributions, that's the thought patterns that they have when something bad happens, how much do they blame a partner uh, when something bad happens, or do, they, or do they excuse their partner of blame? Those would be the attributions. So my target variables might, I might have, uh, it would be the, the communication behavior and the attributions, and my control variables would be uh, the length of relationship and the age at which they got married and number of children. And so in that case, I'd want to say, what's the additional variance explained when I add my target variables to the equation after controlling for all three control variables? So we could do this with sets of variables, uh, but for right now, let me simplify things, and I'm just going to have just one target variable. I'll call that x1. It could be an entire set of variables. The principle would work the same either way. But for this example, I'll simplify things and say I have just one target variable, x1, and I have just one control variable, x2. So again, it works the same way whether I have a set of target variables and a set of control variables, or if I have just one target variable, one control variable. So the very first step, again, we're going to run a series of regression equations. And the very first equation that I'm going to do, step one, is I'm going to compute something called an, a constrained model. And in this constrained model, I'm going to use my control variable, or if it's a set of variables, I'll use all my control variables. So I'll use just a single control variable, if that's all I have, or all my control variables to predict the outcome y but I'm not going to use my target variable, the variable that I'm trying to compute my squared semi-partial correlation for, that one I want to understand how much variance is explained by my target variable. At this point, I'm leaving my target variable out. And as we can see over here, I have my picture of a frog, and I've intentionally picked, uh, got a picture of a frog that looks kind of worried and anxious here because the frog is not understanding x1 is missing. I have my equation here. And I've only got my control variable. I've got x2 in that equation. In that equation, I've got y is predicted by intercept plus slope times x2. And x2, that's my control variable. But that's not the target variable that I want to get my statistic for. That's not the target variable that I want to calculate my squared semi-partial correlation for. So where is that target variable? So I've got my frog looking a little bit anxious over here. But that's the point. That's the key thing is here, our very first step is to calculate this thing called a constrained model. And a constrained model is one that leaves out our target variable. And in this case, if I have just one target variable, it'll leave out that one target variable. Or if I had an entire set of target variables, it would leave out that entire set of target variables. So the constrained model, 
is the one that leaves out the target variable or the target set of variables. And so I'll, I'll, I'll run this regression equation. I'll use my control variable to predict y. And when I run this equation, I'll get my r squared. I'll get the percent of variance explained from this equation right here, from my constrained model, where I'm predicting y using only my control variable, or if I have more than one, only a set of control variables, but not my target variable or target variables. And I'll get my r squared from this constrained model. So then, step two, the next step, we're going to run a second regression equation. And I'm going to call this regression equation the full model. And this model is going to include both the control variable, or if we had a set of control variables, we would include that entire set of control variables. And it will include our target variable. Or if we had a set of target variables, it would include the entire set. So note that Step one, which we talked about previously, that's up at the top of the page here. Step one, we computed a constrained model that included only the control variable or the set of control variables if we had an entire set. It included only the control variable as our predictor. And then step two, we compute, uh, we compute a model that's the full model that has both the control variable and the target variable included in it. So now we have two r squared values. We got the r squared, the percent of variance explained from our very first model that included only the control variable. And we have the r squared, the percent of variance explained from our full model that included both the control variable and the target variable. And again, we could do this like what I have illustrated here with just uh, one target variable and one control variable. Or we'd do the exact same thing if I had an entire set of control variables, an entire set of target variables. So if I had sets of variables, then this first equation would include the set of control variables. And the second equation would include both the set of control variables and the set of target variables. And as you can see, that my frog is now feeling relieved to see, OK, there it is. I now see that target variable. It's been added to the equation at step two. So at this point, we have the r squared from our constrained model at step one, where the target variable or target set of variables was uh, omitted from the model. And we have step two, we have the r squared, the percent of variance explained from our full model, where the target variable or target set of variables was included in the model. And now we simply compute the difference between these two r squared values take the r squared full minus r squared constrained to get the difference between the two. And that's simply what the r squared change is. That's all there is to it. It's just the difference between those two r squareds. And now we see our frog is feeling very excited over here because a frog gets it and understands what the r squared change is. And again, this is, we could call this r squared change, or we could call this a squared semi-partial correlation, two terms for the same thing. And this slide is just summarizing everything I've been talking about. So this delta r squared, which means r squared change, or the squared semi-partial correlation, two terms for the same thing. And you could define it this way. That is the decrement in r squared that, were, that would result if a variable or a set of variables was eliminated from a model. Or you could define it as the increase in r squared that results from adding a variable or a set of variables to a model. So either way, two ways of describing what that squared semi-partial correlation is, what that r squared change is. And as I've been mentioning, we can do this, and this is actually what makes it particularly valuable, is that we can do this with sets of variables. We can start off with a constrained model with one set of variables in it, and then add another target set, have as target set of variables that we add it for our full model, and get what's the increase in percent of variance explained when we added a set of target variables to our equation. Uh, I also note down here, we could actually do this with more than one step. So we could do one step where we have a constrained model, and then we add a set of variables for our full model. But we could actually have, say, step one, where we have maybe three variables predicting y, 
Then at step two, maybe we add two more predictors, so now we have five altogether. Then maybe at step three, we add an additional three variables. And then at step four, we add two more variables. So we could actually have many steps if we wanted to. We could say how much variance is explained at each step as we go along the way. So if you wanted to get really fancy with this, this is something we could use with multiple steps. And just listing all the terms we've been talking about here, the r squared full minus r squared change. We could call that a squared semi-partial correlation. Or if we take the square root of that, we'll have the not squared, just a regular unsquared semi-partial correlation. We could call our squared semi-partial correlation. We could also call that the delta r squared. We could write out the word delta or use a delta symbol. Or we could call it r squared change. So again, just a summary that these are all terms for the same basic type of statistic. Now, whatever term we want to use, whether we want to call it a squared semi-partial correlation or r squared change or delta r squared, what we're talking about here is an effect size. We're looking at what is the additional variance explained in y after controlling for uh, control variables. And talking about the amount of variance explained in y is talking about an effect size. So the question is, or the next question then, is what is the inferential statistic we can use to test the significance of that effect size? Now, if I'm looking at just the effect of a single variable, if I have a single x variable, and I want to know what's the additional variance explained, so I have x1, and I want to know what's the additional variance explained by x1 after controlling for some control variables. If I'm looking at the effect of just a single predictor, after controlling for control variables, then I'm asking the same question as that we address, say, with a beta weight or a standardized beta or a partial correlation. In other words, if I want to know what's the effect of x on y after controlling for control variables, we could address that question with a beta weight, with a standardized beta weight, with a partial correlation, or with a semi-partial semi correlation. And if I'm addressing that question, then the significance will be the same no matter which effect size I use. So I could just get the significance for my beta weight. And we talked about before the fact that the significance for your beta weight will be the same as the significance for your standardized beta. It will be the same as the significance for your partial correlation. And if I have just one predictor I'm focusing on, if I just want to get the effect of one predictor after controlling for a set of control variables, then the, the significance for my beta weight will also be the same as the significance for my partial correlation. But as I said, usually when we want to do the statistic, usually when we want to use the, uh, the R squared change, it's because I want to know about the effect of a set of predictors. I have one set of predictors maybe in my constrained model, and I added an additional set of variables in my full model, and maybe I have three additional variables, and I want to say how much additional variance was explained when I added this set of three additional variables to my model. And like I said, that's moved us from a focused question to an omnibus question. And when we're dealing with an omnibus question, we can no longer use a t-test for our significance test. And we need to shift to an f-test. So if I'm using the delta r squared or the r squared change in the usual way, where I'm wanting to say, I wanted to know what, what's the amount of additional variance explained by an entire set of several predictors after controlling for a set of control variables. So in that case, I will need to use an F test to, to, to test the significance of my R squared change. And here is a slide showing us how we would go about calculating that F value to test the significance of your R squared change. And to do that, I have this F table here. Um, it looks very similar to F tables you've seen before, except for I don't have a very bottom row. Usually for uh, F tables, we have one row where it says regression, one row where it says error, then a bottom row that says total. And But I don't have that here because we actually don't need it. Um, so I've left it off to simplify things. Uh, so what we're going to do, note that when we calculate our R squared change, we had to have a full model and a constrained model. I, I talked about the steps just a moment ago. We have step one, we calculate a constrained model that, in, that includes only our control variables. And then we calculate a full model that includes both the control variables and our target variables. 
And so we have the R squared for our uh, constrained model, and we have the R squared for our full model. But also, when we ran those models, we would have an entire ANOVA table. We'd have all the results when we partition our variance for the, the total variance sums of squares, and the error variance sums of squares, and the regression, the explained variance sums of squares, and degrees of freedom, and mean square and F values. We would get all this output for our full model that, in, that includes all of our variables, and we would get also an output. We would get this ANOVA table for our constrained model that includes only our control variables. So to calculate this, what I'm going to call delta F, and I'll, I'll use delta F to differentiate it between just a regular F value. It's actually still just an F value. So you, you'd be correct to call it, just simply call it F. But for this class, I'd like you to call it delta F, just to be clear and precise that we're talking about the F statistic when we're testing the R squared change. So the, the way that you would calculate delta F is that you need to get the ANOVA table from your full model, and you need to get the ANOVA table from your constrained model, and then we'll use values from those two tables uh, to plug in here to calculate our delta F. So to calculate, our, so we need to calculate our regression, our explained variance sums of squares, and to do that, go to your output for your full model and look at what your your sum, your explained variance regression sums of squares is for your full model and then go to the results for your constrained model and look at what the regression or explain variance sums of squares is for your regression model. And then you take full minus constrained, take the value you got from the, from the ANOVA table for your full model and subtract from that the value you got from your constrained model. And you would put that in this cell right here for your regression or explain variance sums of squares. And then for your regression or explain variance degrees of freedom, Take your degrees of freedom from your full model and subtract from that the degrees of freedom for your constrained model, and you'll have your degrees of freedom for the delta F. Recall that degrees of freedom for regression or explained variance is simply number of predictors. So this is actually taking the number of predictors for your full model minus the number of predictors for your constrained model which is actually the same thing as simply how many additional predictors did you add in your full model. So if your constrained model had only two predictors, and then your full model you added three predictors for five altogether, if you started off with two and then added three, and you had five altogether for your full model, then your degrees of freedom for delta F would be three, because you added three predictors in your full model. So you have your sums of squares, for your explained variance regression, and you have your degrees of freedom. And then as in any uh, calculation of analysis of variance, you take your uh, sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom to get your mean square. And you put that value right here. So take your sums of squares divided by mean square, divide, sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom to get your mean square and put that value in that third column. And then we need to calculate our error values and that's actually really easy. Just go to the output for your full model. And whatever output you, so whatever your sums of squares was for your full model, for error, put that right there. Whatever your degrees of freedom were for error, for your full model, put that right there. Whatever, and it'll be the same. So if your sums of squares for error is the same as your full model, and degrees of freedom are the same as your full model, then sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom will also be the same. So this right here, your mean square error will be the same as your mean square error for your full model. So at this point, you have your regression or explained variance mean square and your error variance mean square. And for any F test, you simply take your mean square explained or mean square regression divided by mean squared error right here, mean square regression, which is the same thing as mean squared explained divided by mean squared error to get your F value. And that is how you would calculate the F. And then as, any, as with any F value, you can take your F value, and then you need to know degrees of freedom. In this case, we have degrees of freedom numerator, which is your explained variance or regression degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom denominator. We need to know those two degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom explained and degrees of freedom error. And if you know those two degrees of freedom and you know your F value, you can go to an F table or find an F calculator, uh, uh, like an online app that calculates uh, probability values for F statistics, or you can do your own calculus and calculate it yourself. 
However you do it, we can, uh, usually I just use computer packages to do this. Uh, we can look it up and get the significance, the p-value, for our f statistic. We can get what's the probability of this f value assuming the null hypothesis is true. And so that is how you would do a significance test for your delta r squared, your r squared change. So we've been looking at these three questions that we can address when we do multiple regression. The question of what is the effect of each x variable ignoring the others? What is the effect of all the x variables taken together? And what is the effect of each x variable controlling for the others? And in each case, we looked at the way that we can calculate effect sizes to estimate the magnitude of effect that answers that question. And then we've also looked at what is an inferential statistic that we can calculate to test the significance of each effect size. So now I want to address a couple additional issues that you need to be aware of when you do multiple regression. So the first issue has to do with something called collinearity, or if you have multiple instances of collinearity, you would call it multicollinearity. So what is collinearity? What am I talking about here? Um, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Let me just give you an overview of why this is an issue. We're going to look at something here, this thing called collinearity, and the issue is it's going to if, if this is present, it's something that's going to uh, make it so that if we were to do a study and estimate beta weights, and then say we want to replicate our study, get a different sample, and replicate our study and estimate those beta weights again, and then we want to replicate our study and do that again, each time we replicate our study, we're probably going to get wildly different results if we have collinearity, which means our solution is unstable. Each time we try to replicate our study, we get wildly different results. In fact, in some cases, it might not even be, might, might be not only unstable, but it might actually even be impossible to do the math to calculate your beta weights. Uh, but usually it just makes it unstable. And so in that case, what it means is that when you estimate your standard errors for your beta weights, that is the standard errors say how much does each beta weight typically deviate from the true population parameter, that if we have this collinearity problem, it's going to make those standard errors very big. That is, it's, your solution is unstable. Every time we do our study, we get a different result, meaning we have very big standard errors. Each beta weight is likely to deviate substantially from the true population parameter. And when our standard errors are big, it means when we do our significance test, our betas will probably be non-significant. So the key thing is that when we do, when we have a problem of collinearity, our betas will probably, or will probably be non-significant. Collinearity causes non-significant betas. Okay, so what exactly is this thing called collinearity that causes these non-significant betas? So collinearity simply means having a high correlation between one or more of the predictor variables in a regression equation. So if I had a regression equation with two predictors, say x1 and x2, and they were both predicting an outcome variable y, if my two predictors, x1 and x2, if they were highly correlated, that would be a problem with collinearity. And if they were not highly correlated, then it would not be a problem with collinearity. So why is it a problem to have highly correlated, highly correlated predictors? Why is collinearity a problem? Note that it's primarily going to be a problem for your beta weights. That is, your beta weights, when you're trying to say, what is the effect of this x predicting outcome variable y controlling for the other predictor? So what is the effect of x1 predicting y controlling for x2? What is the effect of x2 on y controlling for x1? And uh, what I have here on this slide, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you a situation where I have two predictors, x1 and x2, and they both uh, explain a moderate amount of variance in y. They both overlap a moderate amount with y, but they also overlap considerably with each other. So this is showing you a very high correlation between x1 and x2, where these two variables overlap quite a bit. On the right-hand side, it's a picture where we don't have a problem with collinearity. There's no collinearity problem here because my x1 and my x2 variables, my two predictors, uh, again, they both do explain a lot of variance in y, or at least a moderate amount of variance in y, about the same amount as we did on the left-hand side, but they don't overlap with each other very much. 
there's only a small amount of overlap between X1 and X2 on the right-hand side. So the left-hand side is showing you a high correlation between X1 and X2, and the right-hand side is showing you a low correlation. So the left-hand side is showing a collinearity problem, and the right-hand is showing you a situation where there's not a problem. And again, collinearity is going to be primarily a problem for your beta weights, or your standardized beta weights, or partial correlations. That is, anytime you're answering the question, what is the effect of X on Y controlling for the other predictors in the equation? And the issue is, if there's a high correlation between your predictors, then after you control for the other predictors, there'll be nothing left. We talked about this when we talked about extraction, the fact that if you have a high correlation between variables, and one variable extracts all it can out of another variable, if those two variables are highly correlated, then there'll be nothing left in the variable that had stuff extracted out of it. So if we extract x2 out of x1, there'll be nothing left in x1 after x2 extracts out everything it can if we have a high correlation. And that's what we see right here, that after x2 extracts out everything we can, there's just this tiny little sliver left in x1. And similarly, uh, if we extract x1 out of x2, that there's just a sliver of x2 left after x1 has been extracted out of it. Uh, in contrast, over here on the right, if we extract x2 out of 1, still x1 still almost entirely there. And if we extract uh, x1 out of x2, x2 is still almost entirely there. You can think of, whoops, went the wrong way there. We can think of this as kind of like the situation with, uh, I believe it's the beta fish, uh, if I understand right, that uh, if you have a fish tank, I think the beta fish, if you have two male beta fish, uh, they're the same type of fish, but if you put them in the tank together, if I understand right, uh, they will uh, attack each other and maybe kill each other, and that's not a good thing if you're wanting to have fish in a fish tank. That you can put uh, any other type of fish with a beta fish, and they'll do just fine, but you don't want to put two of the same type of beta fish, at least two of the same male beta fish together in the same tank, because if you put two of the same beta fish together, they attack each other, eat each other up, and there's nothing left of either fish, and then you have no fish. And it's the same type of thing when you're doing regression. You don't want to put two predictors together in the same equation if those two predictors are essentially the same thing. So just like you don't want to put two of the same beta fish together in a fish tank, you don't want to put two predictors that are, that are measuring the same thing, that are really uh, two different versions of the same thing, you don't want to put them together in the same regression equation because those two predictors will eat up each other's variance and there won't be anything left in either predictor. And that's what we're seeing over here on the left-hand side is that after controlling for x2, there was nothing left in x1. And after controlling for x1, there's nothing left of x2, at least not much left, just this little tiny sliver. So they've essentially attacked each other and eaten up each other's variance, and there's nothing left in each variable. So if you ask the question, how much variance in y was explained in x1 after controlling for x2? Well, after controlling for x2, there's hardly anything left in x1, and just this little tiny sliver blue area, that's all that's left, and that's so small it's probably not going to be significant. And likewise, if we say, how much does x2 explain variance in y? After controlling for x1, well, after controlling for x1, because there's such a high correlation, there's nothing left in x2. And because there's nothing left, all it can do, the only unique stuff it can explain is this little tiny green area right there, and that's hardly anything at all. It's probably not going to be significant. So when we have a problem with collinearity, two predictors that are highly correlated, we can think of it this way. They eat up each other's variance. Because when we ask the question, what is the percent of variance explained in an outcome after controlling for other variables in an equation? Well, if the other variables are highly correlated and we control for them, there's going to be nothing left in our target variable. And so when we have a collinearity problem, that our target variables eat up each other's, other's variance. And when we look at our beta weights, our standardized beta weights, or partial correlations, that effect of x on y after controlling for other variables in the equation, those effects are all going to be small and non-significant. Now I have a fun little game I would like to play with you. And if you understand everything I've been talking about in terms of collinearity, then this should be a game you can play.
So it goes like this. So on this page I have a table of correlations. I have three uh, possible x variables. I call them x1, x2, and x3, and an outcome variable y. And here are all the correlations. For example, we see that x1 has a correlation of 0.5 with y. x2 has a correlation of 0.51. x3 has a correlation of 0.637. So they actually have all large correlations with y. And actually, every time I do this game, I'm always going to give you a situation where our x variables are uh, strongly correlated with y. And so what's going to happen is uh, I'll give you some different scenarios where I might say, imagine I do a regression equation and I put x1 and x2 together in an equation predicting y. Or imagine I put x2 and x3 together in an equation predicting y. Or imagine that I put all three, x1, x2, x3, imagine I put them all three together in an equation predicting y. And when you imagine these scenarios, there's two key questions I want you to, to consider. Uh, what would you expect regarding the, the omnibus question of our R squared, our percent of variance explained, the capital R squared, the multiple correlation? Uh, what would you expect about the total percent of variance explained in Y by all of our predictors taken together in this hypothetical scenario? So our capital R squared, the total percent of variance explained by all the predictors taken together, what would you expect about that? in different scenarios. For example, if I put x1 and x2 together in an equation. And then the second question is, what would you expect for the beta weights if I put certain sets together? Like if I put x1 and x2 or x1 and x3 or all three together, what would you expect for the beta weights in the output in that type of an equation? And to answer these questions, the thing you need to do is to first look at the, co the correlations in the table and note that on one hand, and it will always be this way, I've got all my correlations have pretty strong correlations with y, so that by themselves, if we look at that question, what is the effect of each x variable ignoring the others? Well, they all have a pretty strong effect. We've got 0 0.5, 0 0.51, 0 0.637 are our correlations, so they all have strong correlations with y. But we want to look at those other two questions. What is the effect of all of our variables taken together? And what is the effect of each variable controlling for the others? And what do we expect given potential problems with collinearity? So the first thing to do is to scan this table and see, do we have any problems with collinearity here? So for example, here's x1 and x3. They have a correlation of 0.32. Now that's a moderate correlation, so that's not too bad. Uh, here we have x2 and x3, their correlation is 0.329. That's also moderate. That's not too bad. But let's see here. I might even change my right here. The correlation between x1 and x2, that is really high. That's almost perfect with 0.995. That's a huge correlation. So there we have a definite, we should be alarm bells, ding, ding, ding. This is a problem with collinearity. Now for playing this game, we'll need to have, it'd be helpful if I give you some guidelines about how big of a correlation is big enough to say it's a collinearity problem. In the real world, it's actually a rather subjective uh, decision to make, and it depends on the situation. Um, so it's hard to give you a really hard and fast uh, guideline for this. But for this class, uh, I'll use the idea that uh, if it's 0.8 or higher, I'm definitely giving you an example of collinearity. Um, sometimes 0.7 or 0.6 can even be problematic, but we'll say definitely if you have a correlation of 0.8 or higher between two predictor variables, that is a problem with collinearity. And for this class, you can use that as a cutoff. So we'll say 0.8, give you a 0.8 there. If your correlation is 0.8 or higher, we'll say that's definitely a problem with collinearity. And so look at the table and see, do we have problems? Well, definitely 0.995. That's definitely larger than 0.8. So we have a problem with collinearity there. So now we've looked at the table. We've identified our problem with collinearity. We're ready to play the game. So for example, what if I say, what if I put x1 and x2 together in the same equation? Put x1 and x2 together in the same equation predicting y. What would you expect about, first of all, what would you expect about the capital R squared, the multiple correlation squared, the total percent of variance explained by all the predictors taken together? What would you expect for that? And secondly, what would you expect for the beta weights for x1 and x2 if I put them together in the same equation? So the first question, what would you expect about the total percent of variance explained altogether? Note that x1 
had a correlation 0 0.503, X2 had a correlation 0 0.51. And if we look at the multiple correlation, which would give us the effect of both those variables taken together, I would predict it's going to be about the same as 0.51. It might go up just a tiny itsy bitsy smidgen, but not much, because we have a problem with collinearity. Now collinearity is not going to harm our multiple correlation. Our multiple correlation can still be substantial if it, if it's, if we have a large correlation here. Uh, we can still have a large effect for our multiple correlation. So multiple, co so multi or collinearity will not harm the multiple correlation, but it will result in a situation where adding variables will not help. So if I have collinearity problems, or I have two variables that are highly correlated, and I get what's the total effect of all my variables for just one variable, and what's the total effect for all my variables if I add a variable, well, they're going to be about the same. It's not going to be of much benefit to add variables if I have a collinearity problem. If my variables are highly correlated, it means they're redundant with each other, and adding additional variables won't substantially help my total percent of variance explained. So if x2 by itself explained um, the square of 0.51, or had a uh, correlation of 0.51, I would expect that the multiple correlation is going to be about the same. Let's look and see. On the next slide, I have output. Here we go. Here is output where I have uh, x1 and x2 are two predictors of my outcome variable y. It's from the same data set we were just looking at. And up at the top here, I have r. This is my capital R, my multiple correlation. And then if I square it, I get 0.269. And just for comparison, let's look at the, usually we focus on the squared version, but for comparison, it's easier to focus on the unsquared version because we can compare that to the correlations on the previous page. So our capital R is 0.519. Let me back up to that previous page and note that that's about the same as right here, our correlation 0.513. So our correlation for x2 by itself at a 0.50, that's a little lower, but 0 0.50, 0 0.513 are the two correlations by themselves. And then when I put the two variables together, the multiple correlation hardly, it went up just a tiny itsy bitsy smidgen, but it hardly changed at all. Now note that this correlation is still significant. So the F test right here, we test the significance of our R squared or our R not squared, either way. We test the significance of our multiple correlation with the ANOVA table right here. The ANOVA table in the middle of the page is testing the significance of our multiple correlation, or our squared multiple correlation, and our F value, 22.307, is definitely significant. So P value is less than 0 .000 something. Um, so we have a, a, a significant P value. So we have our, uh, and, it, and that, that multiple correlation, 0.5, that is a fairly large multiple correlation. So we have a large multiple correlation. It is significant. The key thing is that it's not any better than what we started with by just a variable by itself. On a previous page, here's our correlations. The effect of a variable ignoring the others, say 0.513 or 0.503, is just about the same, go back to our multiple correlation, as our multiple correlation of 0.519. It's not harmed, it's still significant, it didn't hurt anything, but it didn't help anything by putting those two together. So that's the question, what is, if we're looking at, if I put x1 and x2 together, and I ask that question, how does that, what do we predict about our, our multiple correlation? Well, we predict it's going to be about the same as what we started with for our simple bivariate correlations, because adding two variables together, uh, if we have a collinearity problem, which we have right here, because we have a collinearity problem, uh, that's going to make it so adding these two variables together isn't going to explain that, that much additional above and beyond what we had when we looked at them by themselves. So let's look at that next question. What if I put x1 and x2 together? What about the beta weights? What would we expect there? And so now at this point, we look and say, here we have that collinearity problem, and this is where it's going to be damaging. This is where it's going to cause major problems, because if I put x1 and x2 together in the same equation, it's like putting those two beta fish in the same tank, they're going to fight. They're, this, they're essentially the same variable. They're so highly correlated, they're essentially the same thing. They're going to fight with each other, eat up each other's variance, and there's going to be nothing left of either variable.
So let's see how that works. Let's go to our next page again. Here's that same output we've been looking at. And let's go down to the bottom and look at our beta weights here. Here's the beta weights. Here's the standardized beta weights. And then let's go to the end here. Let's start with, look at the, right at the very end. Here's our significant value. So we have a t-test and significance. Note that neither one of these betas is significant. 0 0.324, 0 0.107. So both of those fail to be significant. So we have two non-significant betas. Now if we back up to our correlations, note that both these correlations by themselves were large and significant. p-value 0, 0.000 something, 0, 0.000 something. So if I look at what's the effect of x by itself, ignoring x2, it has a large significant effect. What's the effect of x2 by itself, ignoring x1, it has a large significant effect. But if I put the two together, the beta weights for both x1 and x2 become non-significant because they eat up each other's variance and they both become non-significant. Now, I mentioned before, one of the issues that actually happens here is that because they eat up each other's variance, we're asking our regression equation to do something kind of impossible. We're trying to say, try to predict variance in y using x1, but there's nothing left in x1. Try to predict variance in x in y using x2, but there's nothing left in x2 after extracting x1 out. And so the, the equation is going to return beta weights that are just wildly unstable and bizarre and different. So we actually have, if you look at your standardized betas, we got weird things over here. This one turned negative and became a negative 0.8, and this became actually, uh, this is a standardized beta greater than 1, which is mathematically possible, but when you get it, uh, something like that. That's actually an indication that we got a major problem here. So we got just really bizarre, weird beta weights. So we've got weird, bizarre beta weights and our standard errors, these are actually very large values saying that if we did our study over and over again, we get just wildly different beta weights every time we try to estimate them because we're trying to estimate something based on just a smidgen of something that's left over uh, after each variable has been extracted out of each other. So we've got weird, bizarre beta weights, and the key thing is they are both non-significant. So go back to review our question here. If I put x1 and x2 together in the same equation, what do we predict about uh, which beta weights would be significant? I'd say, well, I would, I would expect both x1 and x2, I'd expect them both to be non-significant. So, so that's if I put x1 and x2 together in the same equation. What if I'm switching, sorry about that. What if I put, say, for example, x1 and x3 together in the same equation? What would we predict there? So note here, if I look at x1 and x3, their correlation is 0.322. That's not really a problem with collinearity. That's okay. So what would we expect about the multiple correlation? If we have 0.503 there, and then for x3 is 0.637. I'd expect, those are both pretty large correlations, but I would expect if we put these two together, given that we don't have a collinearity problem, it's going to increase the total percent of variance explained even more. So if I have collinearity problems, I put two variables together, it doesn't really help increase the total percent of variance explained. But when I don't have collinearity problems, and if both variables are explaining variance in y by themselves, if I put them together, they should explain even more variance in y. Taken together, uh, used together in conjunction with each other, they should explain more variance than any variable by itself because we don't have a collinearity problem. They're not uh, overlapping with each other. So let's see. Let's see what our multiple correlation is when I put x1 and x3 together in the same equation. And this is output right here, where I've got x1 and x3 are my two predictors, and y is still my outcome. This is the same data set. And up here, we have our multiple correlation and our squared multiple correlation. And again, we'll focus on the unsquared, the multiple correlation unsquared, just because it's easier to make it make a direct comparison with our regular bivariate correlations. And here, our multiple correlation is 0.71. So that went up uh, some degree here. And note that still is significant. Here's our F test testing the significance of this multiple correlation. And so it's significant and it's notably larger than either bivariate correlation by itself. So if I put x1 and x3 together in the same equation, then because there's not a multi because there's not a collinearity problem and because they both explain variance in y, then that 
they, taken together, they explain more variance in y than either variable just by itself. And let's look at our beta weights. So here's x1 and x3 down in our bottom uh, table of beta weights down here. And here's our standardized beta weights, and here's our, our p-values from our t-test. And note they are both still significant. The beta weight for x1 is significant, and the beta weight for x3 is significant. And now we have reasonable beta weights we can interpret, 0 0.33, 0 0.529, our standardized beta weights that, that uh, much smaller standard errors. So we have a stable solution that we can interpret with reasonable beta weights, and they're both significant. So because we don't have a collinearity problem, when we put x1 and x3 together in the same equation, they don't fight each other, they don't eat, they don't eat up each other's variance, and they both retain, because they were both started off to be significant in predicting y by themselves, and they both still explain variance in y after controlling for each other. And let's go back to our first correlation table. Let's do one more uh, round for our game, and say, what if I put all three? What if I put x1, x2, and x3 together in the same equation? What would we expect there? So in this case, we have a collinearity problem between x1 and x2. They're going to fight still, but x3 is going to play nice because it doesn't overlap with either one. So x3 will probably increase the total percent of variance explained over what can be explained by any one of these alone. And x3 will probably still have, it will probably have a significant beta weight. But x1 and x2, because they're fighting each other, they're going to have non-significant beta weights. Let's look at the output for that regression equation and see how that comes out. So here I have three predictors, x1 and x2 and x3 are three predictors, my outcome variables y for the same data set. And again, here is my capital R, my multiple correlation, and that again has went up just like it was when I had just x1 and x3 together, and here's the same high value, it went up a bit. So in this case, that 0.71 is a little bit high. We've, we've increased it notably uh, over and above uh, any variable by itself. And that's primarily because we're, uh, x3 is explaining variance above and beyond what could be explained by x1 and x2. And our capital R, our multiple correlation, is significant. And then let's look at our beta weights down at the bottom. Note that uh, x3, we have uh, a beta weight that has a small standard error, and we've got a reasonable 0.52 beta weight, and it is significant. So that that's, makes sense. But x1 and x2, they both have big standard errors. They're just flailing all over the place. If we were to replicate our study over and over again, we'd get wildly different results every time we do our study. Big standard errors, which makes it unusual beta weights. We can't trust these. They're just bizarre results. We can't pay, they don't make any sense and they are not significant. So because we have a collinearity problem, both those beta weights, they ate up each other's variance, and it was not significant. So now, hopefully you can play this game. You can look at a table of correlations and spot whether where we might have collinearity problems, then answer hypothetical questions about what, what, what would happen if we put these two variables as predictors together in an equation, or what would happen if we put these three variables together in an equation, and answer questions about what would you expect about the multiple correlation? Would that get bigger or stay the same? And what would you expect about the beta weights? Would they be significant or would they not be significant? Then one final issue I want to talk about is something called a suppressor effect. And here I have, I think that's a scene from that Monty Python movie. I think the original scene that peasant was saying, help, help, I'm being oppressed. Uh, but I changed it to help, help, I'm being suppressed because that fits our suppressor effect theme here. And here I have a worried frog thinking suppressor effect sounds like something bad. Although actually it's not really a bad thing. It's more of an interesting thing. And uh, uh, so this is something that's actually kind of a rare thing. It doesn't happen all that much, uh, but you might encounter it from time to time. And so I want to make you aware of this unusual thing called a suppressor effect. So to explain what a suppressor effect is, I want to start by noting that usually a partial correlation is going to be smaller than a regular simple bivariate correlation. That is, the effect of x on y, ignoring the other predictors, is going to be larger than the effect of x on y after controlling for other predictors. And I have illustrated that basic idea uh, at the bottom part of this page. 
On the right hand side, I have a Venn diagram showing an overlap between x1 and y. That could be how much does x1 explain variance in y. And I don't have any other predictors there, so it could be the effect of x1 on y, ignoring other possible predictors. And the red area shows the size of overlap uh, between x1 and y, the percent of variance in y that's, ex that's explained, or the size of the correlation. And on the right hand side, uh, I have the same overlap between x1 and y, but I've added a control variable x2. So on the right hand side, we can use that to ask the question, what is, what is the effect of x1 on y after controlling for x2? And this blue area in this Venn diagram shows you the percent of the variance in y that's been explained by the uniqueness of x1 after x2 has been extracted out of it. So the effect of x1 without controlling for other variables is this red area, and that's bigger than the effect of x1 after x2 has been extracted out of it, which is this blue area, because once we've extracted x2 out of x1, there's less of it left, and so there's less of it to explain variance in y, so usually the effect is smaller. So again, usually, if I'm not controlling for other variables, I'm going to have a larger effect. The percent of variance explained in y will be larger if I'm not controlling for other variables. But if I control for other variables, the percent of variance explained by x1 will be less if I'm controlling for x2. So now, usually, the partial correlation is smaller than the regular bivariate correlation, as we just saw. But sometimes it's not. And when it's not, that is what we call a suppressor effect. And I've drawn something like that down at the bottom of this page here, where I have x1 predicting y after controlling for x2, but I've drawn the variance for x2 in kind of this big blob shape to show that the part that x2 is explaining is not overlapping with what's being explained by x1. It's overlapping with this residual variance of y. So now if we ask the question of that uniqueness of y, after x2 is extracted out. Now we've, now we've actually shrunk the total uniqueness of y, but the part being explained is still the same size. And so that makes our effect look bigger. So in this case, if we were to calculate, say, a, a standardized beta weight or a partial correlation, we'd get a fairly big value, at least it would be larger, than what we get over here of the effect of each x variable by itself without controlling for other variables. So we're looking at a situation where our our, our partial correlation, and recall that a partial correlation and a standardized beta weight is going to give us two very, very similar values. So our partial correlation or our standardized beta weight, if we get, uh, if those are actually larger than a regular bivariate correlation, that would be a suppressor effect. And uh, so if you get output and you look at your output and you look at your bivariate correlations, the effect of each x variable on y without controlling for the other variables, and we look at that by uh, just your bivariate correlations, which give you the size of that effect. And then if you look at your standardized beta weights, if your standardized beta weight is actually larger than your simple bivariate correlation, that would be an example of a suppressor effect. So one example of this is, say I had a sample of, sample of people that were in romantic relationships, and all romantic relationships have conflict from time to time, and maybe I wanted to predict communication behavior when people have conflict. I want to predict the extent to which people use good communication behavior where they uh, listen to each other and they find constructive ways to express their own opinions when they have a conflict with a partner. And so that might be my outcome, communication behavior when there's relationship conflict. And maybe I wanted to predict that communication behavior with two types of emotion, two types of negative emotion that people might experience when they have a conflict. Uh, so for example, I might want to have maybe hard emotion, put an H there for hard emotion, which could include feeling angry and annoyed and irritated. It's emotions that when people express it, they often seem kind of hostile. Um, and makes the, maybe would likely make the partner want to fight back. And when people express hard emotion, I would expect it to escalate a conflict and lead to bad communication behavior. And in contrast, uh, another type of emotion could be soft emotion. I'll put an S there for soft emotion. Uh, so soft emotion would be another type of negative emotion. And it would be emotions like feeling sad and hurt and concerned and disappointed.
So this is negative emotion, but it involves a degree of vulnerability when you express soft emotion. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes when you express soft emotion, that might elicit empathy from a partner because it's a softer emotion. It doesn't seem so hostile. So sometimes soft emotion might lead to more positive forms of communication behavior. But soft emotion is kind of a mixed thing because on one hand, it's like hard emotion. It's They're both, both hard and soft emotion. These are both negative emotions that people might experience when they have conflict. So the fact you're experiencing soft emotion, you're feeling sad and concerned, it means maybe there's a relationship conflict going on and that's not a good thing. And so that could be associated with uh, negative communication behavior. So on one hand, soft emotion could lead to increased uh, negative communication behavior or lead to worse communication behavior. On the other hand, soft emotion has this softening uh, effect that it might have that could draw more empathy from a partner and that could lead to better communication behavior. So it's kind of a mixed bag. It could have, it could both help communication behavior and it could hurt it. And so because it's a mixed bag, if I just do like what I have on the right here, just do a simple bivariate correlation where I look at the correlation between soft emotion and communication behavior, I might find a very small correlation. It might be maybe a non-significant small correlation uh, between soft emotion and communication behavior because soft emotion has kind of these two sides. It's both a good thing. It can be softening and elicit empathy, but it's a negative thing because it's a negative emotion people experience when they have conflict. On the other hand, if I put both soft and hard emotion together as two predictors in the same equation and get the effect of soft emotion after controlling for hard emotion, well, after controlling for hard emotion, hard emotion might suppress and explain and extract out all that part of soft emotion that's the negative part, because hard emotion is kind of like a pure negative emotion, and hard and soft emotion might overlap to some degree because they're both negative emotions. So the effect of soft emotion after controlling for hard emotion, what's left over might be that part of soft emotion that elicits empathy, that good part, that softening part of emotion because hard emotion captures that negative part, that part that it's a, a negative emotion people experience when they have conflict. And so if I put them both together in the same equation, then hard emotion might suppress or explain or extract out all that part of soft emotion that's irrelevant, that's bad for the conflict resolution. And what's left over might be that part that helps conflict resolution. So it might be, in this case, the hard emotion would be like that yellow blob and that it's extracting out that part of soft emotion that's that's irrelevant and what's left over is a bigger effect for how soft emotion might uh, uh might be a positive thing for uh for conflict resolution and what we would see the thing that would tell us that this is a suppressor effect is a pattern of, of results where we first look at a bivariate correlation say the bivariate correlation between soft emotion and conflict resolution without controlling for anything, that might be a small or even non-significant correlation. And then if I add both soft emotion and hard emotion together in a regression equation, and I get a beta weight or a partial correlation for soft emotion that's bigger than the, than the bivariate correlation, if my effect gets bigger after controlling for hard emotion, then that would be an example of a suppressor effect. And that is everything for Unit 5 on Multiple Regression.